Good day ladies and gentlemen. Today I'm doing the life of Ellen Bolland since she was born and till this year the unfortunate event of her death. I know this may be a little bit too late to argue and talk about but anyway this is when I got the time to do it. So anyway to get to the point um, Bolland was born in 1944 in Dublin, Ireland. And her father was a diplomat, her mother was a well-known painter. Um, at the age of six, uh, her family, as well as herself, they moved to London. Uh, her father was posted to the Irish Diplomatic Service over there. All right. Now, Evan Bolland seems to like have found it very difficult for her growing up in the United Kingdom, like other than Ireland, because she experienced a lot of anti-Irish prejudice that was common in the time, you know? Now, such experiences um, were expressed in one of her poems that she wrote, which is called An Irish Childhood in England, 1951. And she was made, like, she knew her heritage. She was proud of the fact that she was Irish, for instance. Now. Later on, throughout the years, she returned to Ireland and she attended college, uh, Trinity College and began writing poetry, all right? So this is their, her beginning, the journey of, of starting to write uh, poetry and, and being a professional in terms of, you know, poetry, a professional poet. Now, she found 1960s Dublin a supportive and inspirational environment for a budding writer. Now. The pubs were crowded, the cafes were full of apprentice writers like myself, some of them talking about literature, a very few talking intensely about, about poetry. This is what, what she said. Now, in this atmosphere of pints, coffee and literary chat, Bolland's talent has you know, started to emerge out of the surface in the society and people start to acknowledge this very amazing woman to, uh, that, that existed. Uh, we were of course very lucky to have lived um, a life that that uh, you know that where she was present at the same time in this very era decade <clears throat> um, now she composed the poems that featured in her first book called 23 poems and that was published when she was only 22 years of age and this is very important to note because not so many writers make it at that time, at that age specifically, you know, at a very young age, to, to like age 22, to write a book and publish your poetry and become acknowledged and, and, and well known of around the world, you know, or even in, in, in one country. Um, her life, however, now started to change. She, she started to experience change um, when she got married, when she had her first child and when she moved to the suburb of Dunham. Now, the humdrum suburban life, uh, you know, was not fashionable literary subject matter in 1960s. However, Bolin, Bolin <clears throat> knew a way around it and she found the aspiration, the inspiration to write even in such area. Now, she was keenly aware of how art had neglected to expose the very real and relevant landscape of domestic life, of course. Now, she had an interview with the Irish examiner and she, and I quote, she said, I was a woman in a house in the suburbs, married with two small children. It was a life lived by many women around me, but it was still not named in Irish poetry. So she was kind of stuck in a place where she, where poetry wasn't really, uh, like she couldn't really reflect upon domestic life in that area. Like the life that she was living was really a poetic life. So she found herself being an ordinary woman living in the suburbs with a husband and two kids. Uh, what now? So she found herself <clears throat> occupying two variant roles. Now she was a wife and a mother, of course, the same. Like, and, and on the third hand, she was also a poet, most importantly, for this video. Uh, initially, she saw no contradiction between being a mother and, and and as well as her being a poet or aspirations of being a poet. And she said that I wanted there to be no contradiction between the way I made an assonance fit a line and the way I lifted up a child at night. So clearly, if we 
I mean, this video is for the sake of Evan Bolin and, and the remembrance of her amazing character, but in case you're writing for an exam or sitting for an exam, it's very important to remember how she related her life and her, her personal familiar life to poetry, like when she says assonance, you know? Um, now, <clears throat> she quickly discovered that there was no real tradition of poetry about motherhood and the duties of the housewife. And she said, poetic conventions whispered to me that the daily things I did, things which seemed to me important and human, were not fit material for poetry. You know, like, poets wouldn't really write about such things. And I need to find a way, this is, I'm thinking, like, I'm just trying to think of how she saw things. Like, she knew that she had to find inspiration, I repeat, inside the domestic life of living in a suburb, in, in the suburbs. So no longer was she, you know, a part of Dublin's artistic society where she could, you know, meet other artists and chat about things and come up with ideas, but now she was alone living a regular life, but being a poet at the same time. So she was now confined to the comfortable safety of the suburbs, which isn't really the ideal life that any poet would want to have because you need to face, like it, it, living in the suburbs would, would form a certain, you know, continuity and repetition, routine every day, but living in the city is somehow more adventurous, more, you know, like you live to witness many more things around you that inspire to write about. This was her point of view. So though living only a few miles from the city center, she felt like, you know, like literally being hundreds of miles away from the real artistic world and the, the world that she belonged to when she was a student. And to her literary friends who haunted the city center, the suburbs might as well not have existed. And she said only a few miles away was the almost invisible world that everyone knew and no one referred to of suburbs and housing estates, of children and women, of fires lighted for the first winter chill, of food put on the table. The so-called ordinary world was not even mentioned. This is how she thought about it. Now, this is very important, a shift where her new writing began to explore this very much ordinary world that she thought wasn't inspirational enough, or at least at the beginning thought so. She stopped writing, that's why when you read uh, Evan Bolin's poetry, you will see that her works are somehow divided. The older poems are more uh, related to like her life in terms of like being in the city and uh, you know, like the center and living around her friends and all that and discussing such matters. But the later on poems that she wrote in her later on life are more somehow um, suburb related, Fami like familial. Um, now, she said that poems I had been writing no longer seemed necessary or true, and now her work would focus more on her being, you know, a parent, a spouse, dealing with motherhood, children, husband, all these things that, you know, ordinary poets wouldn't really, you know, find inspiration to write about, but she made it, and that's why she's, one of the reasons that she's special as a poet. Now, this, these were the themes that she dealt with, love and marriage and childhood and motherhood and parenthood or any hood that you can think of in terms of family. She began to write on rainy winter afternoons, as I quote her, with the dusk drawn in, the fire lighted and the child asleep upstairs, which is very much, again I say, not somehow the perfect, ideal... Um, atmosphere for a poet to write in now she her, her her poems gradually or her poetry gradually start to like uh, gain more attention in the public and even worldwide now books such as 1975's the war horse of course contains the war horse poem the famine road and child of our time uh, in her own image and night feed established or made Bolin look like that she was a person or a poet that was writing about a woman's experiences, all right? Something that was extremely rare, not just in Irish poetry, but all around the world. Like, it was very... You wouldn't find such type of writings in terms of poetry. Um, now, she says, I know now that I began writing in a country where the word woman 
and the word poet were almost magnetically opposed. This is how this is the Irish society viewed it, sadly. Um, now, these volumes staked out Boland's poetic territory, establishing the concerns that would dominate her poetic career. History and its victims, Ireland and Irishness, myth and the beauty of the everyday. So, from the late 1960s um, to the late 1980s, she worked as a freelancer, believe it or not, as a freelance journalist as well as a broadcaster. Right, she wrote articles for the Irish Times, which is not a bad thing, it's amazing, at, even at that time, and as a woman, um, and producing programs for the RTE. Now, since the mid-1980s, she has taught writing at several American colleges. She had taught writing. Um, she pursued a career in terms of education and writing, but that didn't really drift like much further away from you know, poetry because she taught writing, which is the essential element of writing poetry, all right? Um, this included the prestigious international writing program at the University of Iowa. Now she was, lastly, before she died, she was a professor of English at Stanford University, which is, by the way, magnificent. And you, guys, you all guys know what Stanford University is and its ranking, like it's one of the most prestigious world-renowned universities. So she kind of made it, not kind of, she definitely made it. Uh, and this is what divided her time between Ireland and the United States. So, um, what is Bolland's poetry really about, like her work? Um, it is about the forgotten voices of Ireland. She's a, she's, a, she's a patriot. She writes about, wrote about, I keep saying writes, it's very sad, but she wrote about... Um, Ireland, the pride, the, the country, the victims, the, the, the bombings, the, a lot of the war, for example. She, she concentrated on that. She talked about the romanticized history of Ireland's independence as well, and the heroic stories coming out of the, you know, to, to shape the Irish history and society as well that we have nowadays. Um, her sense of nationhood was exposed and, and, and flawlessly uh, spread in her poetry. Um, referring to the enormous social trauma of the famine, Bolland indicated, uh, she said, I see that as a watershed, a powerful once and for all disruption of any kind of heroic history, the most wrenching part of the story of the famine is how utterly defenseless people were in the face of a disaster they couldn't control it's also surprising to see how little the writing of that time actually turns to what was happening. Um, looking at the 19th century was the first time I began to think that writing could add to a silence rather than break it. It was interested, I was interested in turning a light on the silences and erasers that we learn to tolerate in the name of history. This is quoted from her. Now, her poetry also talked about like a lot of about womanhood this is when she moved to the sub suburbs remember as i mentioned and, and femininity and this has been deeply rooted in irish society and however what's omitted from irish literature which she as i quote her i couldn't accept the possibility that the life of the woman would not or could not be named in the poetry of my own nation so in a sense she was a feminist, and she brought womanhood, um, motherhood, and that na that part of nature into not only Irish poetry, but on a global level. And she showed many, many more Irish younger poets, female poets, that they can they they can make it, they can do it. And I'm pretty sure that she's the idol of so many out there. Um, now, the experience of motherhood and the larger theme of violence against women is the focus of a lot of her poems, such as the Pomegranate, and, and while, or for example, you have like a poem called The Shadow Doll that she wrote, uh, this one portrays like the sense of suffocating limitations that the traditional Irish society, you know, imposed on a lot of women. So she discusses the issues as well as portrays her ideas beliefs in her poetry and advocates 
for feminism. Um, now, she, Wallen herself, um, when becoming a mother, experienced the internalized restrictions that the traditional Irish femininity enforced. Now, for Bolin, the contradiction between being a woman and a poet was never completely resolved, and she died in that sense. So, she said, these, after all, are the two lives, a woman's and a poet's, that I have lived and understood, and they are lives whose aspirations I honor, and they remain divided, and this is sad to kind of acknowledge. Now, she couldn't really heal such division, and she used the tension that cre it creates as a spur for poetic creativity. Now, as the impetus to create a fresh style of writing with a radically different subject matter. So, to conclude, of course, the saddest story about this, like, 2020 has held so many surprises for us. Um, the Leaving Cert, the coronavirus, the World War III almost happening, Bolland's death, and God knows what's you know what June holds I hope it doesn't hold anything negative so um, I just wanted to put this out there for anyone who's interested to you know learn about Evan Bolin and her life or even use her as a source for his or her poetry or essays or whatever feel free to use these sources um, I myself use a couple of sources and books as I conveyed my message. It's not straight from here. So I read off a lot of quotes and a lot of sentences from very various books. Anyway, guys, if you have any questions about her life or anything, please um, do not hesitate to comment down below or let me know. Thank you very much and see you soon.